Good afternoon. Welcome to noon, Noontime Prayer and the reading of Psalm 18. I'm really glad that you're joining me today on this uh, beautiful and yet rainy sunny day. It doesn't can't seem to make up its mind whether it's going to rain or, or be sunny today, but I'm glad for springtime. It's my favorite season when the flowers are blooming, the trees are blossoming. The hope of new life, the hope of resurrection life. So today, let's begin with prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the beauty of creation. Thank you for mountain majesty, for deep valleys, for sunny days and for rain. Thank you for the birds that soar for the hummingbirds that flit about, for the songbirds that sing out your glory, for sunshine, moonlight, starlight, everything proclaiming your glory and your goodness all around us. Father, I pray that you would give the world eyes to see that you would give us eyes to see beyond our own capacity, Lord. That you would grant us a spirit of revelation and knowledge, a spirit of revelation, Lord, in the knowledge of you. <clears throat> I pray now that as we start looking at transitioning back to maybe a more ordinary life, I'm not so sure how ordinary it is, but some states are lifting their stay-at-home orders. 20 states are from, from my reading. Father, I pray that you would give gov governors and our president and the leader of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and the leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, our own governor, Governor Inslee, and our state representatives and our state senators, and even our city officials, our mayors, Lord, that, that you would give them all wisdom and knowing when to start things back up and knowing when to wait. It would seem prudent that if we start up too soon, the virus will just take off again. And so, Father, I pray that it would be in your timing. In, me, in the meantime, Lord, I pray that you would give people around the world and in our own country, in our own states, and the cities within which we live, that you would shine the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that glory that we see in the face of Christ as he hung on the cross, that glory that he has now seated at the right hand of God, that you would shine the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ into human hearts all around the globe. We pray for a great revival, Lord. We ask that you wouldn't abandon the world, we ask that you wouldn't turn your back on the world. We ask that you would remember us, that you would remember those who have entrusted our lives into your hands. And Father, in the midst of it, I pray that you would break us of self-reliance, self-sufficiency, self-aggrandizement, self-fulfillment, and even self-esteem, Lord. What we need, Father, is Christ esteem. For we love because Christ first loved us, because God first loved us. And so what every human being on the planet needs to know is how much you love us. Your word tells us that in this is love, that while we were yet sinners, while the world was still wallowing in our sin, all of us, Lord, in the mystery of time, you died for the unrighteous. Who would do such a thing? Why not just send us all to hell and be done with us? But no, that's not who you are, Lord. You are a God of justice and judgment 
and righteousness. But your word also declares that you are a God of love, that in your very character God is love, that you are grace and gracious, that you long for your children, for your creation to return to you, to worship you, to give you praise. Father, I'm mindful that the chief sin of the world right now is worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And we, when we turn to worshiping the works of your hand, hands instead of you, it introduces all kinds of sin into our lives. All kinds of consequences associated with those sins. Even within the church, Lord, we have worshiped self, thinking that we could produce a righteousness pleasing to you, thinking that we could produce a life pleasing to you out of our own accord and out of our own strength and out of our own flesh. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be holy and entirely reliant on you, looking to you for everything, for every part of our life, for wisdom, for strength, for healing, for honor, for joy, for peace, for hope, for grace. and for your immeasurable and unfathomable love, Lord. Thank you again for the beauty of creation, for mountain grandeur, for rivers and lakes and seas and oceans. The whole creation praises you every moment, save one part of the creation, the pinnacle of your creation, human beings. We have turned our back on you, Lord, as a nation, as a world. Forgive us, Lord. Show us mercy, Lord. Show us the kindness of repentance, that kindness that leads us to repentance, to a change of mind. May people come to know, may you persuade the world that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh, and that he is Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He is the one who bore the entire burden of the sin of, of the world in his own body and offered his life up as an atoning sacrifice, as a covering sacrifice, as a forgiving sacrifice that we might live. So we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon the world and that your Holy Spirit would convict hearts and that you would soften hearts. Do not harden our hearts, Lord. Thank you for loving us, Lord. We love you in return. To you goes all honor, all glory, and all praise. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining me. We have a rather long psalm in front of us, Psalm 18. It's 50 verses. And I, as I thought about contemplating going through verse by verse, it would have been impossible. We would have hit, been here till dinner time. So I spent some time formatting the psalm with video behind it that might give some understanding to it as we work our way through it, reading it. Then after the psalm, I want to just talk about the context of the psalm, where that psalm arose from and the story behind it. So let's begin, Psalm 18. I'm reading for the New American Standard Bible. We're told, 
that it's for the choir director, a Psalm of David, a servant of the Lord. And so we've been giving instructions to that Levitical choir that this is a Psalm of David, whatever that meant to them, it meant something special because we're told that over and over again in the preceding Psalms we've looked at. A Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So this would have been sung on the day that Saul came to the end of his life along with his son Jonathan when he was battling the Philistines and he fell upon his own, own sword. That's found in 1 Samuel chapter 31. And he said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompass me, and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. <clears throat> he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils, and fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them, and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of water appeared, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not departed from my or and have not wickedly departed from my God for all his ordinance were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me I was also blameless with him and I kept myself from my iniquity therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands and his eyes with the kind you show yourself kind. With the blameless you show yourself blameless. With the pure you show yourself pure. 
and with the crooked you show yourself astute. For you have an afflicted people, but haughty eyes you abase. For you light my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness. For by you I can run upon a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. And who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. He makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon high places. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand upholds me and your gentleness makes me great. You enlarge my steps under me and my feet have not slipped. I pursued my enemies and to overtook them, and I did not turn back until they were consumed. I shattered them so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you have girded me with strength for battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me, and I destroyed those who hated you or who hated me. They cried for help, but there was none to save, even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I beat them fine as the dust before the wind. I emptied them out as the mire of the streets. You have delivered me from the contentions of the people. You have placed me as head of the nations, a people who, have, who I have not known serve me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners submit to me. Foreigners fade away and come trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who executes vengeance for me and subdues people under me. He delivers me from my enemies. Surely you lift me above those who rise up against me. You rescue me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Therefore, I will give thanks to you among the nations, O Lord, and I will sing praises to your name. He gives great deliverances to his king and shows lo loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Herein we have that promise that there will be a king that comes, hidden in this last verse, that there will be a king who comes who will reign forever on David's throne, our Lord Jesus Christ. There you have the psalm. It recounts God's wonders, his anger, his glory in the heavens, and his deliverance of David. So I want to take a look at the context of this psalm. It, that context is found in 1 Samuel, and it really begins with chapter 15 and goes all the way to the end of chapter 31, and then on into 2 Samuel, the first couple chapters. I sat down and read from chapter 15 through 2 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel chapter 2 this morning. I love it, It's wonderful just to sit down and read the whole story. Then you catch its context and how it all pieces together. And that story is the story of Saul. He was made king. He was a very tall man. He was very handsome. The Israelites had called out to God for a king, and God says, I'm your king. You don't need a king. But they kept calling out because they wanted to be like the other nations. What a dangerous thing to be wanting to be like other people or other nations. 
Samuel felt like they were betraying him. And God says, they're not betraying you, Samuel. They're betraying me. And on the day they make, on the day when I give them a king, not too long after, they will cry out for the hardship of having a king over them. They haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. So then Samuel is directed by God to anoint Saul as king. This is in the first part of 1 Samuel. When they go to make him king, where do they find Saul? He's hiding in the baggage along with the, the donkeys and so on. He's hiding in his baggage. I love the King James Version. He's hiding in his stuff. Don't you and I hide in our stuff sometimes? As if God can't see us? As if God doesn't know our hearts? Even now, he sees us. He sees our thoughts. He hears our thoughts. He knows every part of us. I won't tell you the whole story of Saul, but in chapter 15, Samuel gets a word from the Lord that Saul is to go against Amalek, King Amalek and the Amalekites, and he is to destroy them. He is to put them to the ban, which meant everything was to be destroyed. Men, women, children, all the flocks, any living thing, and all of the wealth was to be destroyed, put to the ban. It was clear what God was asking Saul to do through Samuel. Don't save anything out. I had a friend that I met at the midwinter one time, and he asked, he, he asked me, you know, I, I just don't understand how God could have the Israelites kill off whole peoples. But we don't understand how evil those peoples had become. They centered around child sacrifice and human sacrifice. Whole societies from the youngest to the oldest had become so tainted with violence and sin and corruption. That there's no turning back. Remember, sometimes we would go on vacation and we would water our plants and we, when we would come back, we wondered if our plants would survive. Were they pla past that wilting point? There's a wilting point at which plants can't survive, even if you water them. Revelation warns us that when people get into the deep things of Satan, I believe that God is extremely gracious and extremely merciful, and he can save anyone. So Saul goes into battle, and they kill all the Amalekites, save one, they save the king. Strike number one, he didn't kill the king, that was part of the people he was to destroy. And his soldiers saved out the choicest of the sheep, oxen, and goats, the animals, and with the purpose of sacrificing them to the Lord. I know the Lord called us to kill them all, but that would be a waste. Shouldn't we make a sacrifice to the Lord out of them? We're always coming up with contingency plans. We through, see it all through the Bible. Abraham made con contingency plans in the promise of having a son. Isaac made contingency plans. Jacob was Mr. Contingency himself always a schemer. And I look at those men's lives and even Sarah's life, and I wonder, why, God, did you choose them? They're despicable. They don't trust you. They're always trusting in themselves what they can produce. And yet, aren't we just like them? And so Paul, Saul has made his contingency plan along with his men. And as a result, Samuel says, the kingdom has been removed from you. And Saul says, but look at I, I, I've done the sacrifices. I, I kept those animals out to sacrifice to the Lord. Isn't that a good thing? And Sam, Samuel says to him, isn't it obedience to obey the Lord more valuable than any sacrifice? And what I see throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, on into the close of the 
Hebrew scriptures and the old covenant with the death of Jesus. You see people constantly failing him, constantly disobedient, constantly rebellious, constantly looking to ourselves, looking to our own way, looking to our own wisdom, looking to our own strength and capacity to live the right kind of life before God. We've swallowed the lie, hook, line, and sinker, and we worship the creation rather than the creator. We exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship the crea creation instead of the creator. We're still doing it. That lie has crept into our churches. That lie has crept into our theology. We can do it, Lord. We are able, like James and John. Can you bear the cup that I'm going to bear? Yes, Lord, we are able. They had no idea what they were saying. So as a result of Saul's disobedience, the kingdom is removed from him. And Samuel is led to go and find the new king. He's led to, I think it's Bethlehem or is it Hebron? I don't remember where Jesse is, but he's led. And all of seven of Jesse's sons are led before Samuel. The Lord keeps telling Samuel, no, this isn't the one. That's not the one. Until all seven sons have prayed before him. And Samuel asks Jesse, is this all you have? And Jesse says, well, the youngest is out herding the sheep, meaning he's just the youngest. He's, he's not much of anything. So Samuel calls for him to be brought before him, and the Lord tells Samuel this is the one, so he anoints him to be king. We're told that he was ruddy in complexion, that he was tall and had beautiful eyes. He was handsome, not tall. He was handsome and had beautiful eyes. This would-be shepherd king, this boy king, then you have the story of Goliath where this little young lad, David, goes against Goliath and also, in a sense, sets himself against the armies of Israel and Saul who were too cowardice, too uh, lacking in their understanding that they were in covenant with God and God would be their covenant watchman, that he would be their warrior, that he would be their shield, that he would protect them. But David knew those things. He had fought bears. He had fought lions. So he ends up killing Saul with a sling and a stone, cutting off his head. And the Philistines were routed that day. But as David came into town, people were singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And Paul, Saul's pride got the better of him. Instead of rejoicing with this young man who had routed the, the, their enemy, his own pride rose up and now he was dead set against David from that day on. It's kind of a strange thing because he brings David into his house. The spirit of the Lord was removed from Saul and the spirit of the Lord upon his anointing with Samuel fell upon David and instead, God sent an evil spirit. That's strange, but God sent an evil spirit to terrorize Saul. And so Saul's servant said, let's, let's bring and find a master musician, a harpist, who can play for you. And when he, he plays for you, the evil spirit will depart from you. The sense that the Lord inhabits our praises and our music. Enemy doesn't like to listen to that stuff. So David comes and he moves into the household of the king. As his armor barrier, but also as the king's, how would you say it? The one who provides him solace through playing the harp for him. Within a chapter, Saul is throwing spears at David because of his jealousy. David and Jonathan, Saul, Jonathan is Saul's son. They have a great love for each other, this wonderful friendship. They make a covenant. David comes to Jonathan, Jonathan and said, your dad is trying to kill me. And Jonathan says, no way, he's not trying to kill you. David says, well, I'm going to be absent from his house for three days and see how he responds. 
And if he responds with anger, then you know that he's out to kill me and warn me. And we have that wonderful story of the little boy going out to f retrieve the arrows. And Jonathan had to instruct the little boy, if I shoot them beyond, beyond, then you must depart. If I shoot them on this side of the little boy, then you are welcome to come home. And of course, Saul is out to kill him, kill him. So Jonathan departs. And then you have the continuing story of Saul pursuing David. He hides out in caves. He hides out in the wilderness. He goes from one place to another, fleeing Saul. Because Saul knows that David is now the anointed elect, if you will. The anointed king elect. One time Saul comes into a cave to relieve himself. And it happens to be the very cave that David and his men are hiding out in. David's men urge David to kill Saul while he's relieving himself. But David, with much integrity, says, I can't destroy Saul's life. I can't touch him because he's the Lord's anointed. I would be putting myself against the Lord. That's between God and Saul. So he sneaks up and he cuts off a bit of Saul's robe. And then as Saul leaves the cave and goes a great distance, he comes out and he speaks to Saul and he says, I could have killed you today. I'm not against you, I'm on your side. So don't keep chasing after me and harassing me. Saul then repents momentarily. Then again, we find Saul in the wilderness and Saul or, and uh, David and one of his chief men come down, sneak into the camp and steal Saul's spear and his water, water pouch. And then when, as Saul wakes up, David stands up on a ridge and shouts down to him, Again, I've saved your life, Saul. I could have killed you. Here's your spear. Here's your water bag. I've given you your life today. Don't respond to me. Don't resort to this threat to kill me. Saul repents again for the moment, but continues to pursue David. David had the opportunity twice to kill Saul and to take the kingship by force. But instead, David put his trust in God. David actually goes and lives amongst the Philistines and starts attacking Philistine cities from within their own country. But unbeknownst to the Philistine leaders and the king, they don't know he's doing that. They think he's attacking Judah, the cities of Judah. And finally, there's this huge battle between Saul and the Philistines and Jonathan. Jonathan is killed in battle. Saul is shot by the archers, knows that he's going to die, asks his armor barrier to kill him, and the armor barrier, the bearer of his shield, refuses. So Saul asks him to give him his sword, and he falls on his own sword and dies. And then the armor bearer falls on his own sword and dies. When the Philistines on the next day find Saul's body and Jonathan's body, they cut off their heads, take their bodies, and take them, parade them throughout the, the kingdom of the Philistines, and then finally attach Saul's body to a wall. I think it's the men of Gilead, if I remember right. They go by night and retrieve Saul's body, burn his body, and then bury his body. When David hears of Saul's defeat, he sings a song of lament in 2 Samuel chapter 1. So he was lamenting that God had allowed Saul to be taken out. It would be several years before David is finally enthroned in Jerusalem as king. But that's the context. In the psalm, it sounds like David is taking credit for pursuing his enemies. And certainly there was a lot of enemies during all those wanderings that he pursued and he he had a lot of blood on his hand. He killed a lot of people. Yet re he refused to take matters into his own hands. He looked to God and trusted God that he would see his enthronement would take place. That he would see Saul brought to the end of his life or to the end of his kingship. And God did it through the hands of the Philistines. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, we see this same pattern in people's lives and in nations' lives. People go after idolatry. Saul's 
sin was not only destroying the Amalekites, but he went to the witch of Endor to seek counsel from Samuel because God wasn't answering him. He goes to a medium, to a witch. My goodness. And every time the Israelites would, back in the Judges, every time they would go after idolatry, then the Lord would send an oppressing foreign nation to oppress them. And then over a period of time, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, would call out to God. And then God would send a judge or a king to deliver them. And it was a judge in, in the book of Judges. And then they would live in peace for a while until they forgot and go after idols. When we go after idols, the consequences of it are not good. The idol of American culture is self. The sacrifice of American culture is abortion. We are no different than the enemies of Israel, sacrificing our own children to the God of selfishness. And we think that God is going to do anything about it. How presumptuous. How naive. God said of the little children, if anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it is better for him to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the sea. I said that yesterday, but it's worth repeating. Is there forgiveness? Of course. Is there grace? Of course. Is there that kindness that leads to repentance? Of course. But we can never presume on God. We can never assume that we can just walk in our sin and not have consequences and as Christians not have discipline in our life. He will discipline you and he will discipline me. out of his great love for us, out of his graciousness to us. So what can we learn from this psalm and from the story of Saul and David? I think one of the chief points is don't come up with contingency plans. Trust God. Am I saying don't go to doctors and that sort of thing? No, may it never be. He has given us doctors. He has given us insurance. He has given us those all these kinds of protections in our life. But we are to trust God. We come up with our own contingency plans of ways to get our prayers answered. In this pandemic, it doesn't seem like there's much contingency we can rely on other than just to stay home and to trust, trust God that he will bring us through. He is faithful to those who have entered into the covenant that was cut between God the Father and God the Son, cut in the very body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus and God now have covenanted together, and we are in Christ, our representative, our federal head, as they say. And he is our strength. He is the one who brings us into the throne room of grace. He is the one who intercedes on our behalf. Overall, the psalm tells us not to look to ourself. I know David at times is boasting in his own actions, but when you really read it carefully, he says God has been his deliverer. All through the Old Testament, through the Hebrew Scriptures, right up to the cross, that sin of worshiping the cre creation rather than the creator has plagued the human race. That curse of death has always been with us ever since. And as Jesus calls the 12 disciples, they were representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. We're down now to just 12 men. And we hope that they can do the right thing. Peter even says, I will not betray you, Lord. I will, even, I will not deny you, Lord. Even after Jesus has told him, he will deny him. Peter has his own contingency plan. He says, I won't deny you. I'll even die with you. 
And Jesus says, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter's followed Jesus into the courtyard, meaning to keep his promise. He's confronted three times, and each time he says, I don't know him. On the third time, he calls down an oath. I swear, I don't know him. And at that moment, a, a cock crows, and we're told that Jesus is sitting in the firelight of a charcoal fire waiting for the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas, or Caiaphas to, to try him, which was illegal at night. And we're told in that firelight that Peter and Jesus' eyes meet. And Peter flees into the night and sobs and weeps bitterly. What about the other disciples, these representatives of the nation of Israel? Judas betrayed him, and the other ten run into the night. And Jesus goes solitarily, alone to the cross. The only one who could stand. The only one who is able to keep the heart of the law, to love his neighbor and to love God with everything he had and to love his neighbor as himself. The story of the Hebrew scriptures is a story of the descent of humankind. Until all we're left with is the promise of a Messiah. The promised Messiah here on the earth. Now offering up his most holy life as a sacrifice that you and I might live. For consider your calling, brethren and sisters. Not many of you were wise by worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the low and despised things of the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. For God is a source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption who God made our wisdom and our sanctification and righteousness and redemption therefore as it is written let him who boasts boasts in the Lord do you hear that the lie unearthed when we worship the creation when we worship our so ourselves we boast in ourselves we carry the pride of life but he's not called us to boast in ourselves in any form. As it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. He is our wisdom. Jesus is our wisdom. Jesus is our righteousness. He is our sanctification, the process of being made holy. Jesus is that sanctification. And he is our redemption. Even now in the midst of this pandemic, Jesus is our redemption. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Saul looked to himself. We'll find out later, David ends up looking to himself. How long will it take for us as a nation, as a church, as a world, to quit looking to ourselves, but to transfer our allegiance to God and to God alone, finding in him everything we need, finding in him everything required, finding in him that understanding surpassing peace, that joy of the Lord, that extravagant grace, and that boundless, immeasurable love of God. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Not our will, but your will be done, Lord. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the story of Saul and David. It teaches us where to put our trust. David, in that period of life, of his life, didn't take matters into his own hands. He looked to you and let you be the one who, who fought his battles, knowing that when he had to fight, you were calling him to the battle and you were empowering him to fight. You were empowering him and his men to find victory. You brought Saul to nothing. You ended Saul's life. Saul had set up contingency plans. Later in David's life, we see David setting up contingency plans when he gets Bathsheba pregnant. Unless we judge these men, Lord, we are no different. Lest we judge the women of the, of the Hebrew Scriptures, we're no different. We too have turned aside. We too have sought our own way. We thought we could flee the Good Shepherd. O oh Lord, be our Good Shepherd. Thank you that for all of us who have entrusted our lives to you, who have been persuaded to believe that you are the Son of God, God in the flesh, and that you are the Messiah, the one who came to take our sin upon you, upon your Son. For those of us who have been persuaded to believe, you are our good shepherd, we shall not want. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. You, Lord, restore our souls. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. And even though now we are walking in the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Even the enemy of COVID-19. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil, with that joy of gladness. Our cups overflow. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the day days of our life. And we will, we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you for being our good shepherd, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today for Psalm 18 and the reflection on Saul and David's lives. So my final question to you is, what contingency plans are you working on right now? What contingency plans am I working on? Look to the Lord. As I've said in the last couple of days, put Jesus resolutely into your focus. Keep him at the center of your eye. All of Christian life is boiled down from our side to where we put our focus. Do we focus on circumstances? Do we focus on our own abilities, our own strength? Or do we set our focus resolutely on Jesus Christ? It's difficult because everything draws us to look at circumstances, our health, our own strength, our own abilities, our own wisdom. Yet in the end, all we have is the Lord, his goodness to us, his grace to us in which we stand. Thanks again for joining me. We won't be back tomorrow. Tomorrow is our annual ministerial meeting for the Pacific Northwest Conference. So I'll be attending that in the morning and possibly into the afternoon. And then Saturday is our conference annual meeting all over Zoom. And then on Sunday, I'll be back at 11 a.m. for a continuing study of 2 Corinthians. And we're in chapter 5. I think it's verses 9 and 10, if I remember right. Hope to see you there at 11 a.m. on our Facebook page. And if you can't make it, you can watch all of these later on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel with all of these posted. Thanks again for joining me, and now to the blessing. From 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.